Before we start our panel, we will have a video greeting by the Director General of Smart Africa, Mr. Lassina Kone. Please, video. Smart Africa is honored to work with the International Telecommunication Union, ITU, the Digital Impact Alliance, the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, BMZ. The government of Estonia and our member state on this important initiative on digital public infrastructure. I congratulate each team member that has uh, worked very hard on the GovStack initiative. African economy are still predominantly traditional. Natural resources dominate the structure of wealth in Africa. For example, oil account for 43.5% of sub-Saharan African wealth, according to the study. However, natural resources are finite and are not sustainable in the long run. To address this challenge, Smart Africa has developed the digital economy framework, which identified e-government as a key pillar for digital transformations of African economy. Smart Africa's vision of single digital market require online access to all government services, irrespective of borders or countries one is in. This aligns the objective of the Africa Free Trade Agreement by African Union, a key Smart Africa partner. Other opportunities for digital government in Africa include improve efficiency and productivity of government, improve citizen services uptake with e-government, accelerated achievement of the SDG and social economic agenda. ICT is a key enabler of the social sector such as education, wealth, and agriculture. Improve ease of doing business through providing e-services to citizens and businesses is very important as well. With the COVID-19 pandemic, we have seen the need for digital government. But the question is how to ensure proper development of digital governments in Africa. We identified three critical elements for the development of digital government in Africa. One, digital infrastructure. Smart Africa is working towards a resilient and affordable ICT infrastructure through several projects such as Digital ID and the Smart Africa Trust Alliance SATA to enable cross-border services. The One Africa Network projects to ensure accessible, secure and affordable intra-Africa mobile communications by suppressing the roaming charges or the smart device project to cater for increased smartphone penetrations in Africa. Two, policy harmonization. Smart Africa is working with its member state towards policies that will facilitate and promote digital government in an harmonized way on the continent, namely cybersecurity policies, and data protection policies, among others, in order to promote trust and accountability of citizen data by the government. Number three, the Smart Africa created the Smart African Digital Academy, SADA, in order to develop and build digital skills in Africa, a digital literate population, starting with the government officials, is able to uptake the use of the government services online appropriately. For instance, we have trained more than 1,000 government officials since August 2020 on cybersecurity with our platform SADA. The GovStack initiative complements our effort for developing digital government in our member state and in Africa in general. There is no doubt that GovStack will accelerate digitalization and the uptake of public services in Africa. In conclusion, allow me once again to congratulate GIZ BMZ, the Digital Impact Alliance DIAL, and the Government of Estonia for championing this initiative. Smart Africa is committed to support this exciting initiative for the continent 
and invite our value partners to do the same. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you. Now, I would kindly ask to come on stage, Kate Wilson, CEO of the Digital Impact Alliance. Please take the first seat. <laughs> Hani Eskandar, Digital Services Senior Coordinator at the Digital Society Division of the Telecommunication Development Bureau at the ITU. <laughs> Liv Marte Christiansen Nordhaug, Policy Director at the Norwegian Agency of Development, Cooperation and Co-Lead of the Digital Public Goods Alliance Secretariat in Norway. Tony Shannon, Head of Digital Services, Office of Government the Chief Information Officer at Department of Public Expenditure and Reform. <laughs> David Ross, Deputy Head of Sector Programme Digital Development in the German Agency of Inter International Cooperation. <laughs> and the panel will be moderated by my dear colleague Nele Leosk, the Ambassador at Large for Digital Affairs at the Ministry of, Economic Af of Foreign Affairs. Please. Good afternoon. Welcome to Estonia. I'm very glad to see so many people here, and I'm really glad that our partners and friends from all over the world have finally had the chance to gather in, in Estonia. But before we uh, head off to the discussion, I would like to remind that the digitalization of Estonia was actually boosted by a crisis, the crisis where Estonia found itself 30 years ago. Now we can say that we are sort of in the middle of another uh, crisis that too actually uh, is not the result of, of our delib deliberate um, uh, decision. Uh, this crisis has boosted digital development and, and some of these issues that we have been discussing for 20 years, and, and my colleagues who have also been involved in this journey probably couldn't agree more with me, they were actually suddenly solved during the, during the past year. But what this crisis also did is something that Christo was also mentioning in his speech. This crisis actually proved that we are quite similar, because suddenly we were at home, but we needed uh, telemedicine solutions, we needed to continue education. Actually, our COVID applications were rather similar across the world as well. And this sort of reawakened the movement, if I can say or put it that way, the movement of, of open source. Uh, the understanding that we need to share, we need to uh, rebuild, we had, have to localize, adopt, but we do not necessarily have to build digital infrastructure or parts of it from the scratch. So I am very glad that we have gathered here today the champions of, of open goods, public goods, common goods. There are many names uh, used. Uh, and I would uh, like to actually start with, with Liv, uh, who is also the uh, co-lead of the Digital Impact um, uh, Alliance. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the Digital Public, all the, all the names seem similar, yeah? <laughs> uh, the Digital Public Goods um, uh, Alliance, that is uh, uh, one uh, component of the, uh, of the UN uh, high-level panel on, on digital cooperation. So, Liv, as, as you have been now involved in, um, in uh, promoting uh, public goods, and public infrastructure. Could you perhaps just open this um, new scene to, to everybody and, and to see how we all can, can benefit from it? Thank you, Nelle. Thank you so much for uh, having me here. And uh, yes, I call it the Digital Public Goods Alliance. And we have another alliance represented there. So I think I would like to start off by saying that um, I would actually like to hold Christo's presentation because he was very much saying uh, much of the same that I would like to emphasize here. Um, particularly um, the discussion about not needing to reinvent the wheel. And um, I could just give a very brief overview. Uh, the Digital Public Goods Alliance is 
an implementation of recommendation from the same high-level panel uh, report that Doreen mentioned uh, in her excellent presentation. And um, it is really a complementary recommendation to the recommendation on connectivity. So not coincidental, the recommendation on connectivity is called 1A, and the recommendation on digital public goods is called 1B. And it is really about um, accelerating the attainment of the sustainable development goals, particularly in low and middle income countries, by facilitating the discovery and uh, development, adaptation and implementation of existing technologies. So digital public goods, to demystify it a little bit, it's, it's sort of a subset of open source. It is open source uh, software, open content, open data, open AI models, and open standards, but that adheres to certain best practices. So they have been minima, a minimum screened against what is called the DPG standard. So it is, it's not everything, and I think that's important to mention, but it is a subset of open source. And then if we move on then to say, what is digital public infrastructure? you can then think of another subset. <laughs> Within these digital public goods, there are some that are particularly relevant for implementation as part of a country's digital public infrastructure. For instance, the digital identity layer, data, uh, data exchange layer, payments layers. So these, there are existing open source digital public goods that can be implemented as part of what we say is DPI, we have so many abbreviations, and this is really a focus area now for the Digital Public Goods Alliance. Because as Doreen was also mentioning, so again, I would love to repeat so many points from earlier, this need to facilitate vendor diversity on top of this uh, infrastructure is so important to avoid the kind of value lock-in and capture and monopoly capture you've seen over the first part of, of uh, digitalization. So uh, I think I'll stop there, but uh, this is really a, a priority area for us in the Alliance. And I can mention as members, so <laughs> the Alliance is co-founded by the government of Norway and the government of Sierra Leone, UNICEF, and the Indian think tank iSpirit, which has been very involved in the whole uh, India stack and, and, and the, the revolution really that has happened in India. Uh, and we have recently had the great fortune of being joined by Germany and UNDP as new members of the Alliance. And there are also some very um, interesting new member announcements coming very soon. So it's a growing Alliance and it's uh, probably very relevant also to, uh, to work closely with many in the audience here today. So look forward to that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Liv. Um, Digital Public Goods Alliance and also the, also the GovStack in a way form this... Um, base or a ground or at least good hope for, for sort of the implementation and, and wider spread of this philosophy of sharing and, and reusing. And, uh, and Christo uh, also gave us this picture of a, of a, of a, of a building block and house uh, and creating a picture that we can just take one block and uh, replace and then put the other and something we use open source and something we, we use our own. The reality is probably uh, quite more complex uh, so I would like to uh, uh, turn to uh, uh, Kate from Digital Impact Alliance <laughs> uh, to, uh, to ask from you, uh, as you have been uh, building these this partnerships uh, to, to support uh, the development of, um, of digitalization, but also uh, uh, public uh, infrastructure, like what, what are these crucial elements or... or we have heard uh, quite a bit also on uh, on this uh, today in, in the morning and, and now also later in discussions, but, but for working on the ground, what would you say would, would make it work? Um, thanks so much for that question. And uh, like Liv, I will also build on Christo and Bedorian's excellent comments as well as this morning, actually. And I think it's important, you know, let's just take a step back. Sometimes Liv was alluding to, you know, our, our industry, like most, loves acronyms, and so DPIs, DPGs, et cetera. So let's just sort of simplify this. This morning, a lot of what we were talking about was what does it take to put trusted connectivity in place? So first, we have to be able to have enough energy, infrastructure, and truly connectivity, as Doreen's speech well highlighted, to actually connect everyone. Built on top of that are a set of stack components or building blocks 
which with our colleagues at the ITU, we've helped identify over the last few years of what are those common components that have been put in place that actually all countries need just to whatever system they end up using, they're all going to need these common components, which Liv alluded to. ID, data infrastructure, how do you think about security, a payments layer. Every country in the world has that. And Christo alluded then to, how do you then set up a set of applications or building blocks on top of that that then can provide unique services to a new place that are really defined and built actually by the citizens themselves? And it's that trusted layer of set of basic services then allowing um, others to participate in that ecosystem where you build innovation on top. And that can open up innovation across. I like to call those sort of toppings, right? So basically, if you think of this almost as a layer cake, you can see those individual pieces that are built on top. So those are the technical components, but I completely agree with Christo, having come out of software, that that part's not magic and it's also relatively easy to do. What is hard is then to put in place, like, as citizens, how are we all going to have a trust framework around it? Estonia has done a brilliant job of this. India, Rwanda, many others are on this path. And as our colleagues from Smart Africa noted, you know, the African um, continent is really deeply looking into how they do that and build kind of one trusted infrastructure that is in place there. So how do we help spur that on? So our partnerships and what we can do together is actually look as each of us have been saying kind of how do we build on top of what already exists, build on the DPGA standard, build on top of the building blocks that exist, take the GovStack initiative and look at how we can have certain implementations of reference implementations to actually test how that's going to work, and then how do we expose the marketplace or sort of the catalog of solutions that actually already exist to expose those so everyone can rebuild on top of what already, have, already exists in the world and stop um, and innovate on the basis of that. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Kate. Um, many of us are having uh, several of these um, components that, that sort of form our, our, our digital ecosystem or, or even our uh, uh, digital architecture. Um, but as we also heard um, uh, this morning, uh, uh, the, these different components are still not interoperable. And, and uh, for example, when we look at uh, um, uh, some of the developments here in Europe for, for the past 15 years, the, the idea of a common digital identity that we all use and, and that we almost all have, uh, these issues have not yet been uh, solved. And, and this has called uh, for, for stronger and, and larger partnerships. Uh, and um, I would like to ask from, um, uh, from Hani, uh, as the International Telecommunication Union has been part in, in several of, um, of the, the partnerships, sort of to promote uh, the reuse and, and the recognition of, uh, of each other's solutions and, and guaranteeing that, uh, that these are interoperable and, uh, and, and we can work together. So, what is needed to, to make these partnerships uh, uh, work? What, how do we need to work together to, uh, to guarantee that we are, we are heading further and, uh, and not, not staying uh, here? Thanks uh, for the question and thanks for having us. Uh, thanks for asking the question about the partnership because I think uh, from what we heard, the partnership is really will have a key role if we are to accelerate the digitalization and the establishment of DPIs. I mean, the example that Christo said uh, about Estonia taking 30 years to establish where you are now, do you think can countries can wait another 30 years? Of course not. And uh, uh, being you know, in contact with countries, I mean, we see an overwhelming demand of countries now to establish their DPIs. And, um, and they cannot, you know, wait. And they are looking for examples like Estonia and Singapore and India, and that they would like, you know, to leapfrog. And this is where really the partnership will play a key role. And I'm so uh, grateful to be part of, you know, the international community because I see huge opportunities for us as an international community to make uh, this process accelerated. 
There are some key challenges I think that partnerships can address. And one of them is still the issue of lack of awareness about why do we need DPIs? Why do we need to, to think of reusability? Why do we need to think in terms of interoperability, et cetera? Why do we need to think in, 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 uh, in the terms of uh, building blocks? I mean, when uh, Christo was explaining the building blocks, it seems a very common sense, right? It's, it's basic, but uh, this is not at all a common sense when you go to governments. I mean, we heard it so many times from government officials who got it. They need to talk about shared services, shared infrastructure. It's so hard to bring and align the government departments and agencies. Each government department is still, you know, doing their own stuff. They would like not to lose control. They would like to be, you know, doing their own stuff, procure their own systems, which in 99% of the cases are, are standalone systems, not based on any architecture, very much built in a monolithic way. And, and here you go, you have, you know, the same uh, uh, repetition. So. I think the role of one of the things that partner, partner, international partnerships can and should do is really strengthen the case for DPIs, really explain why do we need DPIs, uh, really bring countries who did it to explain it and create a critical mass of people within governments, they really understand it, they bought into it, and then um, they would like to be part of the story. I mean, talking about whole of government is easy, but doing it is so difficult. And I remember one of the um, digital, um, uh, digital government leaders in one of the countries uh, that we are engaged with, he said, guys, my first challenge is get government alignment. And he described it that he's leading a war, a war of alignment. So how can we as international uh, community really make this as a no-brainer? It's not a no-brainer. DPI are not yet a no-brainer. We need to explain the strong relationship between DPIs and digital transformation. I think the link is not clear in the mind of many, many people. You know, DPIs, I mean, I think Kate, you rightly, uh, and I think Liv as well mentioned, it includes digital identity, digital payments, uh, information exchange, etc. And if DPIs are built on good standard-based, interoperable, open standard, open API, you, it is the only way, the only way that you can really deploy transformational services. By transformational services, services are that are presentless, services that are cashless, services that are paperless, services that are frictionless, meaning that information can flow, services that are consent-based. And those characteristics, you cannot achieve them without having a DPI and scale them up as well. And this is the, the basis for all the great stuff that we heard in the morning. I think we heard things around democracy. You know, if you don't have this trust and interoperability framework, you will not be able to really have very, you know, enable voting, for example. You know, enable democracy. If we go even for countries with low resource settings, people cannot travel. And if we manage to make the, the services presentless, meaning that we are hitting equity issues, no one uh, left behind. This is, this is transformational. And I think the, the, re, the, the relationship between DPIs and digital transformation is not something yet in the spirit of everyone. And I think we as international community, we can do a lot to make this a, a very strong case. Last point, um, uh, I would like to highlight also something that we as international community should do is the knowledge skill transfer. You know, now governments need to be in the driving seats. I, I heard myself, many, many governments would say, you know, we would like to do something like x road But it's so complex to do x road <laughs> It's not just, you know, cut and paste. It's, it requires a lot of things, you know. And unless we do real knowledge transfer, I think we're going to, countries will not be able to, you know, have these DPIs, will not be able to reach the digital transformation, as I was saying. And the GovStack, part of what we are doing is that we are trying to create 
digital public goods, but in terms of open specification, open APIs, really unpack black boxes and say, guys, you know, the digital X road, this is the requirement. This is how X road works, by the way. And you can use any open source tools or maybe other tools. Maybe you want to de develop it yourself. This is how it works. We unpack the complexity to make it understandable so that they can own it, they can build capacities around it, and then it's only when they can, you know, lead their own digital transformation. The most important thing that it is about time to reimagine how governments can move to the digital transformation, meaning that they can conceive services digitally and make, uh, you know, being able to deliver those uh, transformative services and I think having, you know, those types of in infrastructure are key and that's why it is so important and thanks for, you know, in, in Tallinn that you are making a full track on it. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Honey. And, uh, and having a follow-up uh, question to, uh, to, um, uh, to David, uh, you have been involved uh, uh, in GIZ with, with many different uh, partnerships uh, since the past years and, and now also in, in the Digital Public Goods Alliance and also the GovStack uh, and have some practical, let's say, experience in, in putting these things work and, and dealing with all the challenges that, uh, that Hani was uh, uh, men uh, mentioning also. From, from your perspective, like how, um, how do you see yourself the value of that kind of, of partnerships and, and if we want to put it into a, a wider global picture, so uh, what is the role of these uh, partnerships in, in building uh, also a global uh, digital uh, public infrastructure? Thank you, Nile. Um, well, as Hani said, it's almost a no-brainer. Um, global challenges like COVID-19 require global action. We need to act as a global community. Um, and regarding DPI, let's give you some numbers. 1.7 billion people lack access to transaction accounts. The same number to digital health services and 1 billion to an identification document. Um, the vision of the German Development Corporation is to implement Tech for Good to foster a human-centric um, digital development. And in that sense, Germany joined the Digital Impact Alliance last Monday because we not only want to promote the sustainable development and usage of digital public goods, but also um, contribute to our more coordinated approach to um, technical assistance and capacity building, as well as um, help mobilizing the required fundings for our um, joint actions and in-country implementation. And specifically on, on, on technical assistance and capacity building, this is where the GAFSTIC initiative is a key strategic flagship um, for the German Development Corporation. Um, whereas we want to, to build a platform for exchange and mutual joint learning uh, and knowledge sharing uh, on how to build digital governments for the future. And um, I'm super happy and, and, um, that in, in, in not even a year, um, this initiative um, not only gathered more than 50 magnificent international exports, um, but also um, enhanced the partnership um, to, to reach out to more leading countries like Singapore and India, as well as the implementation in partner countries like Kenya, Rwanda, Egypt and Ukraine, as well as with the support of the European Commission, as uh, Jutta Orpilainen announced last Monday, um, to the Horn of Africa region. Um, and, well, yes, this is, this is the last point. Um, coming to the European Commission, of course, we want to act as a Team Europe, and um, under the German EU re presidency last year, Germany, Estonia, and uh, nine other member states, as you obviously know, launched a D4D hub to coordinate um, digital development action globally, and um, we hope to, to, to onboard more partners, especially from, from the American side uh, in, in, in the distant future. Uh, thank you. Thank you, David. Um, we have been uh, talking and, and focusing quite a bit on, um, on development uh, uh, cooperation and, and uh, our partnerships uh, 
uh, globally in in development cooperation that that all the examples serve that that we have been that have ma been mentioned here today but uh, but digital public goods actually go much broader and uh, and I would like to um, ask uh, Tony from you um, where do you see these um, opportunities and, and risks for example in countries that already have in place their digital uh, infrastructure for example like uh, like we here in in Estonia and Ireland and uh, and um, uh, the rest uh, rest rest of the Europe also so we have our systems uh, how do you see the possibilities for for let's say open tools the ones that are, are either distributed or, or being developed under the gov stack where do you see the possibilities and and, and but also risks so yeah, thank you, for the, thank, thank you for you. the question. Thank you for the invitation to be here. The, the, this question is very much on my mind at the moment because um, I'm here as I feel among I'm friends and allies of people who share, you know, good values and the right philosophy and the right approach, but um, have a practical challenge. So I work in uh, the government of Ireland for head of digital services in the central department there, and you know, we are I suppose looking at GovStack. Um, the, the, the challenges we have in Ireland uh, are the same in any other country in the world. Uh, Ireland was a poor country, it's now a relatively wealthy country, but we have the same challenges around COVID and climate crisis that um, is on everybody else's mind. So what does that mean? It means obviously we are forced to change, and change is not something that comes naturally to, to some, uh, some of, of, of us, but we are also faced with complexity. Um, the challenge ahead of us um, is best understood as, as a challenge made up of many parts and many working parts and, and relationships between those parts. So it's difficult. You, you, you have to look for the patterns in a complex challenge. And if you look for the patterns, you see people challenges, process challenges, technical challenges. Those three things, people, process, and technology. I think of all of those, one of the biggest challenges is around people and culture. You know, trying to see that they have more in common than, than divide. And it's only human nature to side with your tribe, no matter what level you're at, uh, local, national, or, or, or international. So people tend to be, be drawn to think about the problem right in front of them. I think um, we have two things to do with, um, in the Irish government. One is um, critical infrastructure that we're running to kind of keep um, the ci civil service and the citizens served. And we already have a build to share program in the Irish government. Uh, which does a very good job of, of that. Um, but we also have uh, another program, which is, a, I suppose, uh, reactive to more challenges that are right in front of us. So the digital COVID stuff that came up, you know, demanded a more in innovative approach. So I think what you'll see is that every government will have the challenge with um, running business as usual, with this more s smarter, maybe, thinking, if I could put it like that. And to do that, you might want to have a twin track. And I think that's what we're probably talking about. Some people talk about a bimodal approach, um, where you have to run your business as usual services, but you promote good practice that we all know about in change management around user-centered design and agile development. And by the way, open source is actually taking off and transforming the software industry. So why wouldn't we bring it into to government too? Um, so, so, so a lot of that makes sense as well as open source, uh, open APIs, and so on. Um, and I think I think that's what we're doing at the moment. We're looking at that, and we've seen how that has added value. For instance, in the digital COVID certificate and the COVID tracker app, those solutions have been transformed by those kind of principles and open source code. What we're doing now, out of interest, you might be interested, is we're involved in a review with the 18 departments across the Irish government to talk about their digital maturity journey. And they're all, you know, looking at different functions in, in the Irish government, but they all have people and process and technology challenges. So what we're doing is we're having a set of discussions with each of the departments, and as, as we're doing that, we're showing them the list of building blocks that have been mentioned earlier on that have come from the UNITU paper, the Estonian, the GovStack uh, component stack, and we're saying, do you recognize these components? And so far, so far, so good. They all recognize these components. They all say, yes, we have a requirement for those things. They just hadn't maybe articulated them using the same words. Um, but I think what we're trying to do culturally is get a shared understanding of, of the people and the process of the technology challenges 
And, and by the way, there might be a solution for some of that over there called GovStack. Uh, and if we can get a little bit of a uh, MVP going that allows us to experiment, and I don't know what that will be like yet, but you know that's the aim and why, one of the reasons I'm here, then I think we have the beginning of that. And if other governments were to take something similar approach, then we'd be talking as we are today about how we could share that effort and do that together because there's plenty of work to do and we might as well just share the effort. That's that's how I think we're addressing both the challenges, but seeing as there's a possibility in front of us. Thank you, thank you, Tony, and, and, and thank you all. Uh, we are all very optimistic uh, for, for different, uh, different reasons. And, um, uh, but, but I remember when I got to this um, digital business or uh, digital governance, my first project uh, 20 years ago was called open source software for development, uh, where with uh, different uh, governments and uh, and Tartu University and Stockholm University scientists, uh, we, we brought together uh, uh, different partners to, to really see how to boost uh, the, the, this mindset of, of sharing and, and, and openness. And, uh, and I have to admit that uh, not much uh, has changed uh, within this, uh, this 20, 20 years. This, this open movement did not really kick off. We see now this uh, reawakening, and, and, and I believe that it is, uh, again, higher in, 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 our, in our agendas and, and, and maybe closer to also to, to our hearts. But uh, what is now different, or, or what needs to be done that we, that we wouldn't be uh, in next uh, uh, Tallinn Digital Summit 2041, again in, in stage two, uh, discussing the same, uh, the same problems, the same hopes uh, uh, for, for, for cutting costs, for, for bringing together talent, because this is what it is uh, ultimately also, not to waste our, our talent on something that is already there or, or other resources. So um, I would like to uh, extend on this and, and also comment what we need to do to make it work. And uh, uh, I think I will start with, with, with Kate and, and, uh, and then Liv and then we, we take it further. Thank you. Thanks. Um, you know, it was, it's, I was smiling because I also started in, in the digital development sphere about 15, 17 years ago. And, and I've had people ask me and sort of be skeptical, like, has anything really changed? And I think it's really important to look at sort of individual time periods and then a number of sort of exogenous factors have changed. That, that aren't about digital, but have actually accelerated this. So I think first and foremost is actually moving and the, the agreement of countries around the world to commit to the SDGs and leaving no one behind actually has done a lot to change and foster this. Because when we had a shared commitment about what we were going to do, that made a lot of sense. I think another kind of milestone in that was actually um, organizations, communities, countries coming together, almost 300 endorsers, the endorsing and endorsement of the principles for digital development. Like, what does this mean to actually develop in good practice? So I think we have some of those frameworks in place. But I would agree with you that somewhere between like 2007 to basically just now we're starting to move out of, we've been in this stage of these individual sectoral deployments. But as countries have emerged, Estonia, India, um, Singapore, South Korea, countless others that are really showing of what a unified approach of putting this together can do. You're seeing a move from this sort of sectoral approach to a building block world where we beginning to understand and articulate what that means and demonstrate value from it. I wanna pick up on something that Hani said, like what will change that and that advocacy around it is actually how much more efficient it is for every one of your societies to have this building block approach already in place. And actually the economic investment, and Tony, I'm gonna, you had products, or you, you mentioned products and people. I also like to add pricing, sort of the procurement around it. And then another colleague of mine on a panel last week, actually with the German government said, you know, it's the politics of it. So we've also seen this huge shift where the politics of movement towards what is it gonna take for trust and transparency to take place. The products have been emerging because of deep investments from 
um, NORAD and DHIS2 to uh, many uh, funders around uh, our digital identity platforms, MOSIP, as well as MojoLoop, which is a payments platform. There's been deep investments in each of those individual product components that have been needed. And then as Zareen said, you know, we all need to double down on the people investments and how are we going to do that. But I think that having that shared goal, a set of shared principles about how we're going to develop it, I think identifying collectively what those challenges are and then looking at moving from the sectoral silos to really taking a whole of government and whole of society approach, that together we will move to a place where technology and open source principles and building blocks will really be institutionalized in the way we just do government. And we are designing services, not as digital services, but we're just designing services and digital happen to be the way we're doing it. So I think we're, our collective work is, and collective energy is actually making that possible. And really what every country is doing that shows the way. Um, and so I think if we can quantify that and educate a little bit more, we can, we can move us even further. Liv, please. <laughs> so, uh, I will just agree to all of that. And I think, I think there are so many trends coming together. Uh, some of them are quite recent. Some of them have been coming for a while. Uh, I think um, what you said uh, about this is something that all governments are, are seeing now. So basically this need for national sovereignty and ability to make strategic decisions about one's own digital public infrastructure and how you build that up. I think this is something that everyone is seeing. Some have come through that realization early. <laughs> I think others are more late coming, but it's something that is happening in, in rich countries and in the, in the poorest countries in the world at the same time. I think that's a unique uh, change. <laughs> Uh, if you look uh, at the US, the discussion now around regulating technology, you have Lena Khan sharing the FTC, things, there's a new discussion around the inequalities that have been uh, the result uh, also, and the, some of the externalities that have happened as, as a result of how we have had the first part of our digital transformation, which has also been extremely successful in many regards. But I think everyone sees the need for a shift to make this more equitable. And then I really, I see Amandeep uh, in the back there. And I wanted just to mention uh, the high level panel again, because the high level panel was about digital cooperation. And I remember something that Amandeep said in one of our many meetings <laughs> in that process. He talked about trust through agency. And what does that mean? Uh, I think it has a lot to do with the open source part. And, and I think all of the other things are important, but I think something that is fundamental about the open source part is that it gives everyone the ability to collaborate around something. You don't have to negotiate access. You don't have to have enter into contracts each time. You can facilitate cooperation in a totally new way. So what we're seeing now is really the evolution of some kind of digital commons. So Kate mentioned DHIS2, she mentioned uh, MOSIP. We have, of course, XROAD, which is co-managed by Estonia, Finland, and now Iceland. Uh, and, and there's a whole range. You have SORMAS, which is funded by Germany. So basically, there, there is a growing interest. Some of this is funded by international development assistance. Some of this is governments doing their own stuff and sharing it while doing it like Estonia, Finland, and Iceland is doing. Norway has started to do some of the same with uh, on government platforms. I'm really excited to see what will happen uh, in the US on this. Uh, I'm really excited to see what Ireland will do. I know Singapore is here uh, represented. So how can we build out a kind of like-minded cooperation around these open technologies that fosters democra uh, democratic institution building, human rights, that has the right safeguards around uh, protecting users. Um, I think that is the big question. And I think we are at the moment now where it's possible. I think international development owners, and I think I see USA there behind, uh, behind the mask. <laughs> and I also, I'm also based in NURAD, the Norwegian Agency for Development Cooperation. We have to do our part. So uh, we are core funding several digital public goods, like Kate mentioned. Someone needs to do that. But that is in the way, that's the 10%, right? We also need to support that technical assistance and knowledge transfer that Hani mentioned.
but that has to happen as core development. We have to build that trust through agency. We have to make sure that you know representatives. I mean, there's so if you, when when you talk to people in the in the networking lunches here. There are so many extremely, extremely talented and highly, highly skilled people who have built their, uh, their experience by doing, right? I think that's, that's at least my takeaway from all the Estonians I'm speaking to, is that so many have lived it by doing it. And we have to make sure that that's also how we support even the least developed countries, the poorest countries in the world, they also have to experience it by being part of doing that. But then we have to be able to also fund the really, really complicated task of long-term support for building up that capacity through academic scholarships, grant opportunities, making sure that uh, there are academic institutions also based in the African continent that can support this process so that it's not this idea of from the West to the rest, which is totally outdated in this, uh, this paradigm. And that's the paradigm shift I think we're seeing. So I think we're ready now, but we have to do something actively to nurture that global digital commons. Uh, thank you. And uh, I let the other uh, two international partners to, to, to comment or, or, or build on, um, on these, uh, I would say, positive uh, viewpoints of, uh, uh, of our colleagues. So please, yeah, David yeah. And, and Hani. Well, I can take up the positive um, energy not looking back, but um, again, advocating for building meaningful multi-stakeholder partnerships to, to strengthen the, the local ecosystems. Um, as we see, there is a, a huge momentum for open source at the moment, um, A, from, from the side of the, the, the commissioning parties, as well as from, from the partner countries, um, to overcome monopolies and, and, and when the lock in and, and drive their sustainable digital future. Um, and um, yeah, adding to the examples to to uplifting um, to uplifting um, good practices is almost was mentioned. It was originally um, developed in in Nigeria, rolled out in Ghana as well, and spilled over to to Germany this year, um, and has been um, implemented in 120 um, health um, institutions to 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 manage the pandemic, um, as well as Fair Forward together with uh, Mozilla Foundation. Um, as part of a common voice project that, that recently gathered um, in Rwanda the, the, the biggest local language data set on earth. Um, and yeah, so this, to, 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 to keep it brief and, and, and short, um, again, a shout out to, to build a community. Um, and as Christus said, the, the easiest way if you want to join today um, is to, to enter govstack.global and, um, and join this community. So, Maybe let me let me finish on a very positive note that you know things has indeed evolved a lot. You reminded me uh, in 2003 I've been asked to write a paper for the minister where I was working in the Ministry of Egypt about open source in government. I wrote it. I never heard about it. <laughs> Nothing. The, it was probably not you know maybe too early, but I think now we see demand coming from countries. We see significant skillful leaders in government, and this is extremely uh, positive, optimistic. People now are wanting you know, those kind of things. They want open source, they, have, they are building their capacities, and we just need to you know, come together and accelerate the process. But it's, it's, it, it looks very promising, but there are still a lot to be done. And, uh, Tony. You have the, the opportunity to, to, to wrap up here what, uh, what has been discussed and, uh, and see from the Irish government point of view, where do you see being completely different or hopefully completely different within these 20 years where, where not much uh, happened? Well, I hope, I hope it's going to be different this time because we're at a, we're at a moment in history where things are going to change uh, in, in a good way that are pushed by both the COVID crisis that we've learned from that we need to cooperate and the climate crisis, which means we don't have a lot of time to mess around. Um, I think that um, there's a great book I recommend it everybody. It's about donut economics, um, or it's called donut economics. It's about the social and economic issues of our times. And they're saying that, and Kate Rayworth writes, it talks about, we need to solve problems for people and planet. 
And to do that, we need to think about at least four key players. One is the household, one is the state, one is the market, and one is the commons. We know that we need to look after our people. Uh, we know the state has a much more important role in people's lives than it did two years ago, because governments are now understood to be vital in people's lives. And during the heady days of some political movements, that was not seen to be the case. The market was seen to rule all. Now, the market has a really important role to play here, but the market has learned, actually, that if you want to do to develop great software, you, you deliver it as open source. So they've learned that too. And then the third element that I wanted to mention was the commons, which you've all mentioned already. So what we're seeing, I think, is this you know, movement to be basically people sharing openly in a way that they didn't before and doing it for their own good and for the greater good. That's, that's new. I think that's new. And, 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 and I think when I say moment in history, this is the launch event, or at least seems to be the first time I've heard international mention of GloveStack. So this, this is international leadership now, but behind a, 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 an approach of building blocks that's meant for the many and the few. And uh, it, 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 it sounds like it's got the ingredients to change the game. At least that's what I believe. That's why I'm here. Thank you. Um, I would like to add also from, from my side, uh, working more in, in, in foreign politics now in this position that I've had for the past, um, past months, where I see the hope for the open source is actually, what I was also referring to before, is actually the, the lack of uh, knowledge and, and skills on, on technological trends that are not uh, necessarily taking place in, uh, in our countries. So it has been increasingly difficult for all of us to, to find these people who know how to use uh, technologies. And, and this might give this um, sort of or open the eyes and, and, and really look for partnerships and, and, and share some of these uh, great solutions that perhaps we could not put to our use uh, ourselves alone. But before closing, uh, uh, there was a great uh, e example or practice set in the morning, and I, uh, and I would also like to to continue and uh, and give the microphone to the president uh, Ilves, who uh, uh, wanted to also intervene in in the topic that has been also dear to him in the in the past years. So please. Thank you. I just wanted to make a few remarks. First of all, just to correct something, it's. 25, not 30 years that we've been digitizing. Um, I know because I've, I was the first to propose it and I spent a year being ridiculed by everyone. So before that, there was no discussion. But I think we really have to look. Uh, I don't understand the discussion on costs. When we began the serious efforts that we made in 1999, uh, Toward, where, toward the system we have today. Estonia's GDP was 10% of what it was now, and if you work backwards on Moore's law, everything was much, much more expensive. So, I mean, the idea of cost today for digitization is, is, is not, I don't understand it, because, I mean, we did it as an extremely poor country. Like $5,000 GDP, I mean, per capita at the time. Uh, and how do you do that when you're that poor? Well, there's a no-brainer. You do open source, and it's, I mean, and you invent it yourself. You don't, I mean, bespoke solutions just cost an enormous amount. I mean, I was approached by uh, one country that was bragging about its d distributed digital exchange layer that they were buying for 600 million euros. Uh, for only one one aspect of governance, which was healthcare, and I said, "Yeah, but why? I mean, I mean, you can just do it with your own, with with open source, and you can apply it to everything, and it's not restricted only to healthcare." Um, which gets to the next point, which is that I do not understand the idea of different agencies not agreeing. The, my, I've been advising a number of governments, and basically. Where digitization works, it is in the hands of the chief executive, be it the president or the prime minister. Um, and if you can't do that or the prime minister or president doesn't get it, then you make your, your primus inter pares minister 
the person to run it so that all the other ministers have to listen to it. Otherwise, you end up with this ridiculous situation where you have a digital minister that no one listens to, and then you have all the other ministries who will say, oh, digitization, that's his problem. So you have this complete lack of of responsibility or accountability or anything. So it must be led from the top because exactly this is right. Siloization uh, is a huge problem and we actually spent some time breaking apart all of those silos. And also for background, one reason why we have a distributed data exchange layer is because no one wanted to give up their IT systems. So we said, fine, you don't have to give up your IT systems but you cannot connect to even your own systems unless you do it through our X road. One thing that was completely missing here, uh, I mean, okay, we had some discussion, a little discussion of digital IDs. We had a lot of discussion on architecture software. No discussion of what is, to my mind, the third pillar of any digital governance, which is data integrity, was not mentioned at all, and that is really the third pillar you must worry about once you're digital because, I mean, it, it, you know, privacy is about someone, someone seeing your data. Data integrity is about someone changing your data, and too little attention has been paid to data integrity solutions. But all of that actually comes down to legal issues and, and political will. That is that you can't, you're not gonna have an ID unless you have a digital signature law. Uh, you're, you, need, you need the legal basis. And I've seen governments run and buy stuff for a lot of, for a lot of money to do things that have no legal basis in what they're doing. And one of the things that we have done, sort of maybe because we're so Germanic uh, in our cultural history, but without a law, you can't do it. And you need a law to do it. And there's far too little discussion, uh, if any discussion, about the, what is, are the legal requirements in order to digitize governance. Because you all have laws on well, how governance works, but to make it digital, you also need laws, and and for some reason the discussions are far too technocratic and and sort of focusing on one solution as opposed to another solution without actually taking into account what your constitution says, what your legal architecture is, not just your data exchange architecture, and what is necessary for that, which is ultimately a big political discussion with that all end. But for example, who can see what? What is public? This is a huge question that has nothing to do with tech because the tech can go either way. But you know, in my country, anyone can see what I own. My property register is open. You propose that even in Southern Europe, you say, what, someone can see my property register? No way. So, I mean, you have to take all of these things into account in d doing digitization, and you really need to look at the soft stuff. Um, and back to just X Road one more time. We did it ourselves because we are too poor to buy anything. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, President Ilves. Um, uh, thank you, the, the panelists. Uh, I am looking forward to, to continue and, uh, and contributing to, to the development of, um, of digital public infrastructure and, and really promoting this philosophy behind sharing and, and reusing. And I'm looking forward very much to that. But our time is uh, over. The next uh, uh, panel panelists are, are waiting. And, uh, I am inviting to extend our conversations uh, with a smoothie break, I believe. Thank you all. Thank you, President Ilves. Now we are going to have a smoothie break, and the uh, next panelists are there later. So please applause, please, please, uh, and be on time. We will start at 3 o'clock exactly.